now available in paperback. From the author of the critically acclaimed book, The Man Crisis, comes The Woman Crisis. Learn why so many women have become lost in their quest to have it all in The Woman Crisis. Get your copy of The Woman Crisis in paperback at Amazon.com and online booksellers today. Historical Women in Crisis now, the first historical woman in crisis I'm going to be talking about is Teresa Knorr. And Teresa Knorr is a murderer who wound up torturing and killing two of her six children. Now, Teresa Knorr wound up on the road to becoming a woman in crisis due to the dysfunctional ways she grew up in a poor California home. Now, Teresa Knorr possibly wound up growing up in a home where she didn't get her economic needs met, and this led to her having fears of being taken care of. And that fear was possibly exacerbated because she possibly also didn't get her emotional needs met, and this laid the foundation for the insecurity that wound up undermining Teresa Knorr's ability to have any relationship with any man. Because if a girl does not get nurtured by her father, she does not have any emotional security. And if a father cannot provide for his children, this goes out here and, and creates a situation in a child's mind where they feel like they cannot get any sort of fiscal security. And all of this, these insecurity issues, this leads to a girl not being able to form a healthy relationship with a man when she gets older. And in the case of Teresa Knorr, when she went out here and got married to her first husband, Clifford Clyde Sanders, when she was 16 years old, she was not in a place where she could be a help me to a man because she was on the road to becoming a woman in crisis due to all of the emotional insecurity she had from the dysfunctional home she was raised in. And as she was getting married to Clifford Clyde Sanders, she could not health cleave to him in a healthy way. No, because she did not trust Clifford Clyde Sanders, because she did not trust her father to provide for her family, what happened to Teresa Knorr is that she wound up becoming extremely insecure, and those insecurities led to her wanting to try to control the relationship and be the one who was supposed to be the head of the household. And because she did not want to submit to the authority of her husband and didn't want to trust her husband to be the head of the house, what she did was challenge his authority by looking to try to possess and control him. Moreover, she also tried to dominate him and tried to make him submit to her authority. And because she was trying to make him submit to her authority and was trying to dominate him, what she did was try to go out here and continue to again aggressively attack him and also made lots of accusations of him cheating. And all of this insecurity basically wound up destroying the entire structure of their relationship. And even though they had two children together, this was what led to Clifford Clyde Sanders wanting to leave his home in 1964. And on June 22nd, when he told his wife, Teresa, he was going to leave. This is where Teresa wound up exploding in a rage and wound up pulling out a gun and shooting her husband in the back. Now, while Teresa Knorr was on trial for the murder of Clifford Clyde Sanders, this is where Teresa Knorr tried to explain that she killed him in self-defense because he was abusive towards her, but basically everyone knew that was a lie, even the people in his own family. They all, even her own sister, said that Teresa Knorr would kill him before any other woman could have him. Again, showing the insecurity that this woman had about getting her, about getting her needs met, and because she was insecure about getting her needs met and was so possessive of this man, she could not trust this man to go out here and be her husband. No, everything had to be her way, or it was no way at all. And when somebody decided to stand up to her, this basically shattered her whole smooth world that she was trying to create as related to subjugating her children and this and, and, and her husband. 
And this basically was what led to her looking to explode in rage because she had to deal with the reality of somebody basically standing up to her. Now, even though her own sister and many of the nor of her own family testified against her, this somehow Teresa Nor was acquitted for the murder of Clifford Clyde Sanders, and that was quite troubling because even though she was making accusations against Clifford Clyde Sanders of cheating and not being there for her, this is where she wound up going out and was, again, she did this even while she was pregnant. And again, she wound up having a third child with a, I believe, another man. And somehow she wound up after this entire trial and getting acquitted. This is where her entire life just fell completely apart. And Teresa Knorr wound up becoming a heavy alcoholic. And she became an alcoholic, I believe, because of all of the guilt she had of destroying her relationship with Clifford Clyde Sanders and was feeling guilty about murdering Clifford Clyde Sanders. This, is, this woman, again, she wound up destroying her own life because of her insecurities and looking to dominate a man and trying to control him, all because she was afraid that she wouldn't get her needs met. And as this was going on, again, she wound up having those two children and, again, had those two children, then wound up getting married to Robert Knorr, a U.S. Marine. And as she got married to U.S. Marine Robert Knorr, this is where she found out she was pregnant with a, again, a third child, I believe, during their relationship. And they had four children during their three-year marriage. And Teresa Knorr's insecurities, again, got the better of her. And instead of her looking to trust a man in a marriage, she looked to try to dominate another man. And what's really disturbing here is we have a U.S. Marine, a man who has been trained to have the, one of the strongest disciplines and resolve, and even he could not put up with this woman and her just insecurities. Things got so bad as related to her going out here and constantly drinking and then accusing her husband of infidelity that even this U.S. Marine, again, a man trained to have some one of the strongest disciplines, could not have enough discipline to remain in a relationship with this domineering, emasculating woman. And he finally wound up leaving Teresa Knorr in 1970. And as he left in 1970, this is where Teresa Knorr basically wound up showing her true colors. And she wound up showing her true colors to a railroad worker named Ronald Pulliam. And at, with this relationship with Ronald Pulliam, she went out here with her nights of partying and leaving him with the children because she basically did not respect him as a man. And she didn't respect the authority of any of her husbands. No, this woman went out here and at her nights of partying, left him with the children, and went out here and lived the life that she actually projected onto those men, saying that she wanted to go out, those men were cheating on her, but she was actually the one out here possibly having an affair. That's what Ronald Pulliam believed. He believed that, that his wife was out here basically partying and out here with different men, but she went out here and projected this on to... Ronald Pulliam, and he finally just had enough after just a, a year or so, because uh, he married her in 1971, I mean, no, he left in 1976, and this is where he wound up leaving, and then she got involved with copy editor Chester Harris, and as she got involved with Chester Harris, this is where her insecurities further escalated, because she saw that her second oldest daughter, Susan, was becoming close to Chester Harris, and as they were forming a bond, this is where this is where Teresa Norris' insecurities got even worse because as she got insecure about her her daughter growing up to become a woman, this is where her insecurities wound up es rising to another level because just like um Gert um. Gertrude Maniszewski, she became insecure about having to compete with a, a, a younger woman in her daughter, and as she became insecure about having to compete with her daughter due to the dysfunctional way she was raised, this is where she wound up filing for divorce 
from Chester Harris in 1976, and as she wound up um, going and filing for divorce in 1976, this is where her insecurities basically started to simmer to a hot and boil to, to an anger. And in that anger, she became extremely volatile because she knew she was getting older. She knew she could not compete in the social marketplace. She knew that she had basically failed to have successful relationships with a husband. And as she saw that she was losing control over her social life, she wanted to destroy the lives of her children. And she, as she just went to, de to try to destroy the lives of her children, she then dominated and abused them because she was feeling powerless about her own state of life getting older. And this is where she went out here and started abusing her children, not letting them be able to go outside, have friends over, or even use the telephone. And then further escalated her anger on her children by going out here and burning them with cigarettes, force feeding them or and starving them, and even held them down, made them hold each other down as they beat them. And she focused mainly on her oldest daughters. One, I believe, because the father was the one man she first man she killed, and two, because both of those older daughters basically could enter the social marketplace and compete. And they could go out here, and if they were able to have successful relationships with a husband, this would embarrass Teresa Knorr, and it would embarrass Teresa Knorr because it would show that she was the problem that led to all of her relationships failing, and this is the thing that led to Teresa Knorr having anger at her two oldest daughters, Sheila and Susan, one, again because that she hated their father for being the first man to leave her, and because he was the first man to leave her, this is why she wanted to go out here and believe bad things about them, because she was, one, jealous of them, and she didn't want, again, want to compete against them in the social marketplace, and this is why she was out here projecting the idea on her second oldest daughter, Susan, that she was a witch, and as these daughters were basically looking to go out here and move on with their lives, in 1982, Susan was 16, and Teresa Knorr shot her in the chest with a pistol, and the bullet was in her back, but Teresa Knorr didn't let her get medical attention, even though she survived the injury, and then two years later, she wound up stabbing her daughter, Susan, and as Susan was trying to leave for Alaska, she was trying to go and move on, but Teresa Knorr insisted that she could leave only if she could remove the bullet from her back so that she wouldn't go to jail for abuse. And sadly, Susan agreed to this, but this crude surgery wound up causing sepsis and led to the death of Susan, who Teresa Knorr showed little love for because she went out here, took Susan's, had her oldest sons take Susan to a valley, place her on the side of a road, and light her body on fire. And it was just so sick and twisted what this woman did. Again, she when, when the authorities found the body, they could tell that she was alive at the time of the fire, but they couldn't identify her body. And again, this is just the evil that this woman did, all because of her insecurities. And after murdering Susan to keep her world smooth, she then started going after the oldest daughter, Sheila, who became the next victim of her abuse. And after a disagreement about Sheila's alleged prostitution. Again, this is what these insecure women do. They project all of the things that they really want to do onto their children and their husbands because they don't trust those men to love them and they don't trust anybody to love them or care about them. What she did was beat her up and hog tie her before locking her in a hot closet with no ventilation. And this led to her oldest daughter, be dying in that closet of dehydration and starvation. And then after this, she made her sons do the dirty work. They placed her body in a cardboard box and disposed of it near an airport. And this is, again, the sickest thing you could do to your children, have them participate in this type of sick and twisted abuse and an effort to go out here and, again, make your world smooth. And in a sad attempt to go out here and destroy the evidence, Teresa Nora made her youngest child try to burn down the apartment they were living in and then went into hiding, abandoning her children, all but one who were suffered ties with her. Now, Nora and Robert Jr., 
her son wound up moving into Las Vegas together, and Robert was arrested after murdering a bartender. He basically was a man in crisis and wound up on the road to being in, in the penitentiary with Bubba Tiny Roscoe and Big Dave. And after this, Nor fled to Las Vegas and moved to Salt Lake City. Now, Robert Jr.'s brother, Terry Nor, wound up going to the police about the murders. I mean, no, Terry Nor. Yeah, the sister wound up going to the murder of her sisters, but no one believed her until she contacted America's Most Wanted with John Walsh, who helped her open a case, and they were able to link the murders of the sisters to her mother. And finally, Teresa Nor was arrested in her home and charged with two counts of murder and two counts of conspiracy to commit murder. And she was going to be plead not guilty until the until her son wound up testifying against her and that's when she pled guilty in exchange for a life sentence and she why and she deserves to be in prison because this murderous mother was a monster and she was a monster due to the insecurities that she had due to the dysfunctional way she was raised inside of that home and due to the poverty she lived in and because of the poverty she lived in she wanted to go out here and have power over everyone but that quest for power wound up undermining her ability to have relationships with other people and it wound up undermining her ability to have relationships with other people to the point because where everything fell apart because in order to have a healthy relationship with a man or even your children you have to trust the people that you love and sadly Terry nor I mean Teresa nor couldn't trust anyone and because she couldn't trust anyone this is why she every relationship she had fell apart and sadly led to the death of two of her children and led to many of her other children like Robert jr. winding up becoming men in crisis showing that if you get with the wrong woman it can wind up destroying your life and the whole thing is is that this woman basically not only destroyed the life of her first husband by taking the life of her first husband she he killed both of his children and he wound up destroying the lives of two other men's children again showing that this woman basically was a woman in crisis who should not have been in a relationship until she got mental health counseling because clearly this woman was sick from minute one and she was so sick because of all of the insecurities she had and it was those fears that undermined her chance at any sort of peace no she brought trouble to the world because somebody her parents didn't meet her needs and when her parents didn't meet her needs she wound up taking away from all of the lives in, of the people in her life. Now, the second historical woman in crisis I'm going to be talking about is Juanetta Hoyt. Now, Juanetta Hoyt is a serial killer who wound up murdering all five of her biological children when they were babies. And Juanetta Hoyt wound up on the road to becoming a woman in crisis early in her teens when she started having her first serious relationship with Tim Hoyt. Now, this relationship with Tim Hoyt was one that was extremely dysfunctional, and I believe it was dysfunctional due to the dysfunctional way she was raised by her family, and because of the way she was raised by her family, she was extremely clingy to her boyfriend, then husband Tim Hoyt, and I believe that was because Juanetta Hoyt never really got her emotional needs met by her father because usually when girls don't get their emotional needs met by a father who is the one who nurtures them and lets them know that they are loved, what they do is go out here and start becoming extremely insecure and whenever they get involved with a man, they try to hold on to that man like a security blanket and as they try to hold on to that man like a security blanket, it creates a codependent relationship where this woman basically tries to get all the power in the relationship and they try to do covert things in order to maintain control over that man. And that's basically what Juanetta Hoyt was trying to do with Tim Hoyt. What she was looking to do 
was not love him in a relationship. What she wanted to do was possess him, and she was so desperate to possess him that she wound up dropping out of high school in 10th grade to marry him in 1964. And as they got married in 1964, she started partic participating in peculiar behavior, as Tim's family allegedly describes. Now, she had no desire for a career but to be a housewife, but that desire to be a housewife was a way to try to get power in a codependent relationship because what she wanted to do was be able to control Tim and make it where she could have him around her at all times. But this man wanted to go out here and try to be a man and build a life. And he found it difficult because this woman would constantly go out here and beg him and try to manipulate him into not going to work. And when he did go to work, what she would do is try to call him at his job, trying to demand help with numerous crises, many related to her health. But all of these crises were all a part of trying to get control over this man and trying to get a codependent relationship where she could go out here and get her emotional needs met by creating these crises and also get control over this man as related to all of these crises because he could not go out here and be his own man or be the leader in the relationship because most of the time he would be just chasing behind her going out here dealing with all of the drama she was creating and that's what Juanetta Hoyt basically was she was a drama queen who was insecure and wanted to hold on to this man because she was just again afraid of not being able to trust him to go out here and come back and want to have a relationship with her now as this was going on Tim's family noticed that she would wear maternity clothes even when she wasn't pregnant. Again, another effort to try to get attention for herself because she felt extremely insecure. And as she felt insecure, they went out and had their first child, Eric, who in 1965 suddenly stopped breathing. And this is when Juanetta when Hoyt ran outside screaming for help. Now a neighbor tried to do CPR on this child, but sadly it was too late. And, and she was the only one in the house with the child. And the whole thing is that she was just caught up in this whole need for attention. And as she was out here and out here with the child, again, as, at the, as the child had a funeral, she fainted and had to be revived. Now, after the, after the death of the first son, this is where the Juanetta Hoyt's insecurities continue to get worse. And those insecurities continued to get worse because she not only wanted this to be the center of Tim's attention, but she wanted to get the attention of everybody else after seeing the attention she received once that child died. So what happened here was that when Edna Hoyt escalated her behavior because she saw that she got a lot of attention from the drama regarding the death of her son, and she wanted more attention and the way she thought that she could get her emotional needs met was by going out here and creating a lot of drama and this is where she started escalating her behavior to making the crises that she had extreme to the point where she was basically looking to try to dominate and control her husband tim by even threatening suicide if tim didn't come home right away and all of this constant nagging and harassment due to the insecurities led to it being very difficult for Tim to keep a job. And as he tried to build a life with this woman, he wound up having another son. And then two years later, wound up having a daughter named Julie. And while she was pregnant with Jimmy, Juanetta, and, and Jimmy was just a toddler, they moved out of the house into a trailer on the property, but they possibly could have had their own home if they if this woman wasn't so insecure and in undermining her husband. And even though there was space, the family saw the children, and she put the she had this so-called model behavior as a mother on the outside, but she was seething with anger and rage on the inside, and this was show in her in these explosive temper outbursts where she would scream and even slap her children and from normal mistakes that they would make like toddler messiness or crime and some people thought it was her being anal but it really was her having insecurities about change 
and really upset about having to go out here and deal with the changes in her life and not being able to control everything. That is the thing that I believe motivated Juanetta Hoy to start taking out more of her anger on her children. She felt like she had no control like she would have in before with trying to control her husband with the drama and she also wanted to get more attention for herself and she wanted to be the center of attention for herself so she would become extremely insecure and those insecurities started to mat further manifest when her two and a half month old daughter wound up stopped breathing again and again she flagged down drivers to try to get help but then she told the doctors that the child had choked from drinking rice cereal from a bottle and the two-year-old two weeks later wound up collapsing and stopped breathing again and people they list the cause of death as adrenal failure and again this was three children who wound up dying when they were just babies and as those two, two those three children wound up dying as babies that's when a doctor named Dr. Stenschenheider decided to start studying Molly and he started to do this because he had hurt, wanted to break the tragedy of deaths with the Hoyts and he came up with theories as related to sudden infant death syndrome and came up with the theory of, of leaving children on their backs. Unfortunately, none of that was due to this whole situation. No, it was all about Juanetta Hoyt becoming an extremely insecure woman who wanted to get control over her whole life and wanted people to just keep paying attention to her because she didn't know how to get her emotional needs met by a man due to the dysfunctional way she was raised by a, her father or her lack of attention she got from her father. And this is what led to her basically winding up killing three of her children. And then as she had a fourth child, she brought the child to the hospital and the child had a slight cold but was breathing normally. And then the child wound up eventually winding up passing away. And then a fifth, then after this, this is where the child was blue and they thought it was, was, it was SIDS, but then they said that the death was due to pneumonia. And then Dr. Sentisida went out here and did more research and wanted to prove that the Molly's that the fourth child, Molly's death, was due to apnea related SIDS. However, as he went as they went out to the funeral again, this child wound up passing. And again, Juanetta took the fourth child's death differently and was instead of her grieving for the child, what she did was go out here after the funeral, bought herself a new dress, and then went out dancing with Tim. And two months later, she was pregnant once more with her fifth child, Noah. And this is where Dr. Stenschenheider wanted to take the child to the clinic and where, as soon as he was discharged from the hospital when he was born. And the child seemed perfectly healthy. But Juanetta was out here showing her insecurities as related to Tim's attention. And again, the child was the one who was getting the attention, and that basically made her feel like her life was basically changing. Again, this woman couldn't deal with her life changing, and as she didn't deal with her life changing, this is where she started to take out her anger on this fifth child. And as she took out the, the anger on this fifth child, he stopped breathing and dying. Now, after losing five children, this is where Tim decided to get a vasectomy, thinking that it was a genetic flaw that he had that led to the deaths of his children. And this is where they decided to adopt a child on a six-month basis, but Juanetta sent it back because she feared she might hurt him, again, letting people know that the real problem was her. Unfortunately, due to our gynocentric system, people couldn't see that it was her. Now, she also started having suicidal thoughts and was prescribed medicine to control her anxiety and depression. And she was really anxious because she consciously always wanted to, again, go out here and harm this child because she wanted attention for herself. But people weren't getting on to her and she was basically slipping as related to her behavior. And after this, they adopted another boy named Jay. Now, Tim couldn't work anymore and he was able to stay home with his wife and his adopted son, but his son had no health problems. And this also lost the opinion that they thought that the child the children were killed by something genetic. However, the Hoyts were basically were out here and her mother's health was going downhill. Again, the, the whole thing is that she wanted to get the attention for herself, so she continued to go out here and create drama. However, as Dr. Skensenheider went out here and did his research on Juanetta Hoyt as related to SIDS, 
This made him some money. However, people didn't see his theories as plausible, and they thought that this was basically her smothering the children, and eventually this information started to come out in Syracuse when William Fitzpatrick, a assistant district attorney, wound up on a case where he found a man who killed three of his kids for insurance money and was told that there's a worse serial killer in his backyard as to, to Mrs. H, the case in Stench and Hyder's paper. He got a copy of the paper and agreed that it looked like murder, and as he left the DA's office and relocated, it was when he went in 1992 and that he went out here and did an investigation on the case, and when he did an investigation on the case, what he did was find out that Juanetta Hoyt was a murderer. He brought her in for questioning, and she confessed on how she murdered all of her children, and it wasn't sudden infant death syndrome. She just smothered the children, and she smothered all of the children with pillows and towels. She smothered one with her chest, and again, murdered all of her children, murdered them all, all because she wanted to have her smooth world where she could continue to be the center of attention and wanted to use the deaths of her children to get attention for herself all because of her insecurities and as she had these insecurities this really was really where she where she was the reason for the motive for murder and she confessed to these crimes but then later recanted her confession and and pleaded and pleaded not guilty and when her trial began in 1995 her husband and her son tried to rally to her defense but nobody believed everything as related to that case and she wound up becoming convicted of the of the murders of her five children and wound up sentenced to 75 years in prison However, she wound up dying of pancreatic cancer before she could go out here and appeal her case. And even though she had gotten had died, the state of New York, still participating in gynocentrism, continued to exonerate her and tried to exonerate her and give her a pass. And that's the saddest part about this woman in crisis. She needed to have been held accountable a long time ago, but she got a pass from our gynocentric criminal justice system. But that whole gynocentric criminal justice system and a whole bunch of men like Dr. Sensenheimer, again, enabled this woman to take the lives of five children and took the lives of these five children. Again, not because she was um, angry about um that about about having children she was angry because she couldn't control anything and because she wanted to have power and control over something this is why she wound up taking the lives of her children and this is a sad part of a murderous mom in crisis now the third and final murderous mom i'm going to be talking about in this installment of the historical women in crisis series is deborah green now, Deborah Green is an American physician who murdered her two children when she burned down the family home and poisoned her husband with ricin, trying to murder him for leaving her. Now, Deborah Green was originally born Deborah Jones, and Deborah Jones was a brilliant little girl who had great intellectual promise and taught herself to read and write before she was three years old. Now, Deborah Jones was somebody who had participated in numerous school activities at the two high schools she attended, and was so smart, she became a National Merit Scholar and co-valedictorian of her class. And while she had all the book smarts for success as related to a professional career, unfortunately, Deborah Jones wound up becoming a woman in crisis because she did not have the social or interpersonal skills in order to navigate life in the world. And as a child who basically grew up in the age of feminism, she was indoctrinated into feminism and wound up becoming a woman who really did not understand how to function in relationships with men. And because she didn't understand how to function in relationships with men, this is what led to Deborah Jones, who then eventually wound up getting married two times, winding up in a situation where she just didn't know how to work in a relationship with a man. Now, Deborah Green, 
Deborah Jones eventually wound up, as she was attending the University of Illinois, taking a major in chemistry. And while she wanted to become a chemical engineer as her career, she then decided in 1972 when she graduated that the market was flooded with engineers and decided to attend the University of Kansas School of Medicine and decided to become an ER doctor. And as she took a residency at the Truman Medical Center, she then met Dwayne M.J. Green, an engineer. And after the couple wound up marrying at, while she was studying at the University of Kansas and lived in Independence, Missouri, Deborah finished her residency. And by 1978, they wound up separating. And I believe they basically wound up separating for several reasons. The first reason I believe they wound up separating was due to the incompatibility of feminist indoctrinated women with men, because most feminist indoctrinated women, they have a power issue. They want to be the head of the relationship, and because they want to be the head of the relationship, this leads to them having a power struggle with the man that they're with. And because these women do not want to submit to the authority of the men they are involved with, what these women do is go out here and challenge that man's authority. Moreover, these women don't have respect for that man, and that lays the foundation for their incompatibility as partners. And while Deborah Green says she had no common interest with Dwayne Green, she, I believe, had a thing that basically led to them breaking up, again, which was the incompatibility. And I also believe what happened with Deborah Green was she was slightly jealous of Dwayne M.J. Green being the engineer she originally aspired to be. And because she was jealous of this man having a career and the success that she had wanted to have in engineering, it basically made her envious to the point where she didn't even want to be in the same room with this man. And this laid the foundation for a lot of the anger that she had for Dwayne M.J. Green. And I believe that this was the foundation for a lot of the anger that was laid the foundation for her to become a woman in crisis later on in her life. So I really believe what happened with Deborah Green was she just tried to make this relationship work. Unfortunately, a feminist and a man cannot work in a relationship because a woman doesn't want to submit to a man and be his helpmeet in a relationship when she's a feminist. And again, a feminist is incompatible with a man in a relationship, so things aren't going to work between them. Now, as Deborah Green was out here and she was throughout her under going, uh, going to her last year of medical school, she then met Michael Farrar, a student in his 20s. And while Michael Farrar was struck by Deborah Green's intelligence and vitality, he really wasn't a guy who could read women. And because he couldn't read women, he didn't understand that this woman would not reflect on him positively because she had a habit of ex having an explosive temper at minor slights. And I believe that that explosive temper was due to the frustration she was having at seeing her husband have the career that she dreamed of in the beginning. And because she was angry subconsciously at her husband and jealous of him, this is why she was out here exploding in this anger and was expressing disrespect for her for, for, for Michael Farrar, who basically was one of these beta males who was used to submitting to the authority of women and didn't understand that this woman was not one who was compatible with him, one, because she was feminist indoctrinated, two, because she was already married previously to another man, and three, was somebody who was suffering from emotional issues, emotional issues that were basically exacerbated due to the spiritual bond that she had with her previous husband, because when a woman goes out here and has sex with a man, she winds up forming a spiritual bond with that man. And when she goes out here and has that spiritual bond with that other man and then gets involved with another man, this is what causes a conflict within her spirit. And that conflict in her spirit 
is one that causes that woman to really start to become extremely unstable as related to her mental health and becomes mental health again because her spirit is bonded to another man and that's what leads to that woman become has starting to have issues like that explosive temper. Now, Deborah Green thought that Farrar would be the stable, dependable presence, but what she was really looking for was a beta male provider type to be the man that she could get involved with after the failed marriage to the man that she thought was going to be perfect for her. And really, this guy couldn't see that he was basically being picked to be second best and be the provider type that would be the simp that she could go out here and have under her while she went out here and had and was able to control this man and have the power over that man that she felt like she couldn't have in her own personal life. Now, while when Michael Farrar got um, admitted to a career in medicine, he was working at the um, internal medicine at the University of Cincinnati. The couple moved to Ohio, and Deborah Green went into practice at a Jewish hospital as an emergency physician, but then became dissatisfied and eventually switched specialties and began a second residency in internal medicine, joining Michael Farrar's program. Now, as Deborah Green was married to Michael Farrar, they then started to live in Cincinnati, Ohio, and this during this time is where Deborah Green developed a series of medical issues, including surgery on a wrist, cerebral migraines, and insomnia, and even that she was had dealing with these issues, she wound up having their first child, then returned to do a fellowship in hematology and oncology in the University of Cincinnati, then had a second child, and still went on to go on after her maternity leave to complete her fellowship in 1985, opened up her own private practice in hematology and oncology, and finished the last year of a cardiology fellowship, then joined a established medical practice in Kansas City, Missouri, and then as she started her own, after this she started her own private practice, which prospered until she took on maternity leave for her third child in 1988, and all of her children were enrolled in the Pembroke Hill School of Private School, and Deborah Green was a good mother for some time, and she was a very good mother for some time until her last maternity leave, which led to her winding up with chronic pain, and this chronic pain was the thing that led to her giving up her practice to become a homemaker, and she worked part-time from the family's home doing peer reviews and medical processing, and as she was working part-time, she was basically becoming cold and distant and was simmering, as I see it, and boiling in frustration and anger because she saw her husband having success as related to her career and because she saw him having the success and was not feeling connected to him, this is where she started to become obsessive and started to become possessive of him, and she became obsessive and possessive of him, of this beta male because she didn't see him as a man. She always saw him as property and wanted to exert her power over that property, and she did this because she felt like she was losing control, one, control over her life, and two, she also felt like she was basically seeing everybody have the success that she was promised as a child. And this is what frustrated her. She saw herself not having the success that she wanted. I mean, she saw Dwayne MJ Green, her ex-husband, he went out here and had the career that she wanted. She was angry about that. And she was all angry because all of the pain she was in was preventing her from being able to have the career as a doctor that she wanted. And as a result of all of this frustration and this stress, this is where Deborah Green began self-medicating with sedatives and narcotics to deal with the pain from the infections. Again, she was giving herself all sorts of prescriptions for herself. And this is where she started having issues with, again, her demeanor and her speech patterns because of the drugs that she was taking. And take again, she was a doctor who prescribed herself her own, doc her own medicine, and that's never something good because a doctor should be 
talk, getting a diagnosis from another doctor who can objectively assess their issues. But instead of this, what she did was write herself prescriptions and go out here and take sedatives and narcotics. And this basically led to her becoming a real serious problem as related to their relationship. Now, the Farrar children were raised to be on the road to success like Deborah Green. Unfortunately, as the kids were coming up, they had they were dealing with a mother who basically was trying to become, again, too strict and was putting the children down, driving them hard, and driving them hard because she was frustrated about not being able to have success that she always wanted. Now, the entire relationship between Michael Farrar and Deborah Green was never ideal, and it wasn't ideal because while this woman was someone who had all the elements of success, like many feminist indoctrinated women do, she did not have an emotional or personal connection with any of her husbands. Moreover, she didn't have any sort of the coping skills to or be a model for her children or any of the coping skills in order to know how to deal with everyday conflict. No, because Deborah Green didn't know how to navigate through her emotions, and while she could feel she didn't need to act on her feelings, what she would do whenever things went wrong was go into a rage, and as she went into that rage, sometimes she would harm herself or break things, and she would never really discern whether she was in public or private. So she really had a lot of poor interpersonal skills, and those poor interpersonal skills undermined her relationship with her husband and her children. And this and everything as related to her maintaining her home as a homemaker, she really wasn't very good at it, like many feminist indoctrinated women are. No, they have no ability to, again, process uh, things as related to social situations. And Deborah Green's inability to function in social situations really made things really hard in Michael Farrar's home to the point where he knew he could not really work with this woman as a beta male to avoid dealing with his wife's inability to be a helpmeet in the relationship because she was a feminist. What he did was go out here and start working long hours to avoid arguing with his wife. And in her efforts to avoid arguing with his wife, he showed that he could not really lead the family. And as the couple wound up fighting, what Deborah Green would do is go out here and project her anger onto the children by treating them as small adults and go out here and tell the children, especially his son, Tim, that everything he did wrong, a way to emasculate Michael Farrar and going out here and doing this, what this did was undermine Michael Farrar's male authority because in order for children to respect a father, what they need to do is see the mother respecting his authority. And what Deborah Green wanted to do was go out here and emasculate Michael Farrar, a man who basically was out here submitting to his wife. And this, what this did was lead to the children beginning to resent Michael Farrar to the point where even Timothy, his own son, started having physical altercations with him. Now, things had gotten so bad inside of the marriage that Michael Farrar asked Deborah Green for a divorce. And as Michael, as Deborah Green was having these issues, she believed that Michael Farrar was having affairs and was taken by surprise by his desire to end the marriage, and she wound up exploding in a rage, shouting and throwing things. Now, this is what happens with beta males because he was asking for a divorce instead of just leaving and then taking custody of his children. So this guy basically was coming from a position of weakness, and as he came from that position of weakness, he basically showed how much of a punk he actually was. Now, he had already been married to, again, a very toxic woman, and this toxic woman was one that wasn't one that he was compatible with, but he was still, he had, for a long time, was trying to force things to work until his complete emasculation, and as he was emasculated, this is where things wound up breaking up as related to Michael Farrar and Deborah Green, and this was the thing that led to them winding up breaking up to the point where Michael Farrar moved out of the family home, 
and they still tried to work together to make sure that the kids would do well. And after a separation, he put down a bid on a six-month, six-bedroom home in Prairie Village, Kansas, and but backed out before the sale went through. And he was, and things were as related to his marriage and his debt load made it where he didn't want to buy this other home. And eventually, they, their own home in Missouri caught fire. And as their home caught fire, this is what led to Deborah Green and Michael Farrar winding up being able to leave that home. And eventually, he wound up buying that home in Prairie Village, Kansas. And as he met, bought that home in Prairie Village, Kansas, he also took another trip to Peru with his family, trying to avoid having to deal with Deborah Green and her toxic behavior. I mean, this woman basically did not have any sort of emotional connection as related to this man. And again, if a woman isn't feeling emotional about a man, she cannot connect or bond with that man because she doesn't have any feelings for that man. So that was a major problem with Deborah Green and Michael Farrar. But because beta males cannot really read women and cannot read their behavior, they get involved with women who they are not compatible with. And even though things aren't working out, they'll still try to shoehorn themselves into things. And that's what Michael Farrar was trying to do to try to hold his peace with his children. And the whole thing is, while he tried to make changes, nothing really changed as related to Deborah Green and Farrar. No, they wound up, at, by around 1995, winding up uh, on the road to a divorce again. And what happened in 1995 is that Michael Farrar befriended Margaret Hacker, whose children attended the Pembroke Hill School. And Hacker was a nurse and married to an anesthesiologist, was unhappy with her marriage. And the two of them began an affair after both families returned for Peru. And that's where... Michael Farrar decided to ask Deborah Green for a divorce once more, with Deborah Green responding hysterically, telling the children that their father was leaving him, trying to emasculate him. And this is where Deborah Green basically wound up getting upset because her children would be disqualified from being debutantes at the Bells of the American Royal. And even though the family was about to divorce, Michael Farrar decided to move out of the family home. And this is where Deborah Green went and further went into a state of decline, becoming a woman who was on the road to becoming a woman in crisis and started becoming a heavy drinker. And as she became a heavy drinker, she then looked to go out here and continue to try to take care of her children. But she was still seething with rage and she was seething with rage now because she had seen that she couldn't have the career that she was promised. She couldn't go out here and have a family. And all of these frustrations about the failures in her life basically led to her going to start drinking alcohol to the point where she was basically lost control of her ability to even think about how she spoke to her children. And also, one day when, the, when, when she was on at, at home, the children found their mother unresponsive from drinking. And this basically wound up with her basically starting to go on a real state of, again, life as related to her personal life. And she had been, she had disappeared from the home at one time and had an episode where she had been hiding in the basement when he was searching for her. And all the time she had claimed to be wandering around town hoping to be hit by a car. I mean, this woman's behavior had become extre extremely erratic. And Michael Farrar, instead of him grabbing his kids and taking his kids and looking out for their personal safety, moved out of the family home in early autumn. And I believe it was possibly early or to, as related to his safety, again, participating in the bitch move. Instead of looking to protect his children and making sure that they were taken care of, what he did was just run away like a coward. And as he ran away and, and like a coward, what happened was that Deborah Green, who was angry about the failures of her life and angry and dwelling on all of the failures in her personal and professional life, all of her frustrations, what she wanted to do was finally get back at Michael Farrar. What she wanted to do was hurt him by destroying the home he bought her. And he wanted to go out here and destroy the home that he, that he bought her and destroy all of his children. That's what she wanted to do as related to the entire situation. 
and the only child that was smart enough to figure out what was going on was uh, um, the youngest daughter, I think Kate, she was able to understand what was going on and was able to get out of the house before it burned down. And this, and what was happening as related to this entire situation was the entire home wound up getting destroyed. And it was so disturbing what happened to Tim and Kelly, the two children that wound up losing their lives. Kelly wound up dying in her bed due to smoke inhalation, but Tim's body was found on the ground near the kitchen and wound up again he died in his bedroom, but because of smoke inhalation and heat, his body fell through the floor. And again, this is just extremely disturbing that a woman would do this to her children. But this is what happens with feminist indoctrinated women, again, because they have no real connection to people and no real connection to anybody that they're supposed to love. Whenever they get angry at a, somebody, especially a beta male, they explode in rage, never thinking about how their actions are going to harm someone else. And this is what happened with Deborah Green after she went out burning down the home. She then at burnt down this home and tried to, again, make it look like the um, situation was one that was completely different than what happened. She wanted to say that the illness, she, she was sick as related to trips to her trip to Peru, but the whole situation, I don't believe, had anything to do with any sort of illness that, that came from Peru. No, she was really angry and frustrated about the just complete failure of her marriage, and she wanted to destroy everybody in, as related to that family because she was angry about it, and she was so angry that she basically was out here looking to poison her husband with ricin. She traveled all the way from one part, from Kansas to another part of the country, to go buy this the seeds that are used to make ricin and was poisoning her husband with ricin and was looking to go out here and murder her children because evidence was shown that it was an accelerant was thrown on the sides of the house. So what Deborah Green was looking to do is what something that many beta males look to do whenever life doesn't go the way they want. Whenever life doesn't go the way a beta male wants, what the beta male will do is look to destroy the world around them. And that's the same thing with feminist indoctrinated women. Whenever life doesn't go the way they want, what they want to do is destroy the world around them. And that's exactly what Deborah Green wanted to do. She was frustrated because she could never fulfill her promise as a brilliant chemist. She couldn't have the career in chemistry she wanted. She couldn't make a relationship work. She couldn't make a family work. And because she was angry that she couldn't make life work due to the dysfunctional way she had been raised as related to feminism and was completely incompatible with, excuse me, any man that she was with, this is where she wound up looking to destroy the world around her and looked to destroy the world due to all of the frustration and anger that she had as related to making her entire life fall completely apart. And as her life fell completely apart, this is where Deborah Green wound up getting confronted by the police as related to the arson case, as related to the poisoning case, because there was evidence that she went out here and bought castor beans as related to making the ricin. And again, just shows how evil this woman had become and how twisted she had become because of everything and it's related to the evil she participated in. And again, she was out here looking to go out here and again participate in all of this evil because she felt she couldn't live the life that she wanted. And eventually the police managed to check things out as related to evidence. And this led to Deborah Green winding up getting arrested. And after she got arrested, she pleaded no contest as related to all of the charges and wound up in, in prison for the rest of her life. Now, this woman, again, had, is just one of the most evil women I have ever read about, and she's one of the worst cases of a mom, but she was on the road to becoming a woman in crisis 
from the days when she had her first relationship because she really just, again, did not know how to function in a relationship. Yes, Deborah Green had great book sense, but she didn't have much as related to emotion, which is, again, something a woman needs to have a connection with a man. So she couldn't connect with men, nor did she have the coping skills to know how to work in a relationship. She didn't know how to be a helpmeet to a man. And this made it where instead of helping her, her husbands, she looked to destroy her husbands because of her envy and her jealousy. So Deborah Green is one of the most sick and twisted women I've ever read about. And she's definitely a textbook case of a woman in crisis. Now, if you want to learn more about what leads to feminist indoctrinated women winding up on a road to a paradigm of failure, you can pick up my book, The Woman Crisis, on Amazon.com in paperback and Kindle format. You can also find The Woman Crisis at other online booksellers like Smashwords, the iBookstore, Google Play, and Barnes and & Noble. And if you want to see me make more videos about historical women in crisis, you can send a donation to the Patreon, the PayPal, or the Cash App by clicking the link in the description box. That's all I have to say for this video. You can comment, rate, and subscribe. Now available in paperback and Kindle Unlimited, The Man Crisis. Learn why so many men are struggling to find their way in an increasingly gynocentric world in The Man Crisis. Get your copy of The Man Crisis in paperback and Kindle Unlimited today. Support Black-owned and Black-operated digital broadcast media, www.niceradionetwork.com. Nice Radio Network, broadcasting 24 hours a day, 7 days a week.